I've been doing actual lives for almost 30 years. I was asked to do a workshop for people with disabilities. And I was gonna do all these theater things and workshoppy things and, you know, and we were gonna read from plays and I look and I thought, no. So I just said, let's, let's start talking, tell me your stories. We've done it here before a couple of times in Tallahassee and each time it's been incredibly different. Each time we've had many different kinds of people. And this time it was called Our Actual Lives because we're coming off a horrifying year. What you're gonna do is you're gonna write for 15 minutes. You're not gonna make it pretty, you're not gonna edit, you're not gonna spell, you're not gonna worry about grammar, you're gonna spit it out. And you can write about a number of things, but it's, it's, it's kind of within this thing because right now, as we all know, we're in this churn of emotion. Give me your most powerful memory. And, and or write about your, what is your obsession in this time of COVID. Oh, what is your most powerful memory about this time of COVID or just in your life? Don't think about it too much and just write. We need to talk about people, what they're feeling now, you know, about our actual lives. The people who live here in Tallahassee, our neighbors, because we need to get to know each other again. We want to reach out to people who are, who are even more different than we are, and talk to them about their lives. Because again, we think those are the stories that are gonna bind us. My name is Anthony Beers, and I'm from Miami, Florida. Hi, I'm Matty Ward. Jacqueline Denise Curry. I was born in New Jersey. My name is Basta Wind. I was born in Elizabeth City, North Carolina in 1954. My name is May Evelyn Ziegler Cleveland and I grew up in Frederick, Maryland. My name is Sonia Magnelis. Rebecca Lynn Metcalf. I'm Matias Mad Matt DeWarno. I'm originally from Buenos Aires, Argentina. My name is Shakafrica Kanishua Herring Simmons. My name is Dorotha. Williams, but people call me Dora. I was born in New York, but I was raised in Florida. I was born in a little teeny town called Ironton, Ohio. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts originally. Born and raised right there in Smoky Hollow. I used to have to wear my footwear until my footwear wore out. My mom was wore out. She worked tirelessly for years to provide for my brother and I so that she could buy shoes that my peers would laugh at when they got worn out. In school hallways, always with my head down. Not because I was ashamed, but because I was entertained. Looking at the kids my age with all the shoes I couldn't afford never made me bored, it made me dream. I aspire to have my footwear admired. Now pairs, I have many. My selection covers the color spectrum. With over 100 pair, I see no signs of coming up for air. My obsession wasn't birthed through narcissistic ways. It exists because I remember the days when I didn't have. My obsession might be success or perfectionism. 
I want to live up to everyone's expectations. I know that may sound bad, but those who know me have told me that they see the best in me. And I appreciate that they see so much in me. I get motivated to be successful, also because of my parents. By this time, my dad was getting ready to come to America and my mom already had my brother. I know that they have done a lot so I can enjoy my life and do more. I sometimes worry that I won't be as successful as I imagine when I think about the odds and the likelihoods. I hate doubt. I doubt myself or make a mistake and I get upset because I feel as if I'm taking steps backwards when I do that. What I do know is that being perfect won't guarantee success because no one is perfect. I also know that what makes you successful is different for everyone. I don't intend to stop working hard and making sure I'm doing the things that I love. I need to remember to acknowledge my wins and know that I got this. In 2006, I was working for Reverend Byron Barnhart in Monticello, Florida. I got my check and I was really excited and I figured that while I'm here in Monticello, I might as well just go ahead and get this check cash. And I asked him, do you want to take me to cash a check at your bank? He said, I'm sorry, babe, but it's noon and banks are closed. So I said, why are banks closed at noon on Thursday? Um, it's not a holiday or anything. He said, it might as well be because Every Thursday at noon, when they used to do the hangings in order for everyone to be able to like watch and see for entertainment. That's happening now in this day and age. Right now, Monticello, their bank closes at noon on Thursdays. We have our own lynching tree here in Tallahassee, right behind. My name's Mickey Doody, and I'm ashamed to be white. I am appalled, sickened, and outraged at the atrocities going on in this country even today. Mankind, huh? Obviously not so damn kind. I grew up in Irish town, which some perceived as the wrong side of the tracks. Oh well. I had many black friends in school. They didn't care about the tracks they had their own. My best friend Charlie Edwards was a young black man living in the projects. It was 1968 and we were freshmen. One day Charlie come home with me after school. Mom and dad were both working at the time. We sat down at the piano and started playing and singing. For some reason my dad come home early that day. He come through the door and gave me the look. Charlie saw the look and he left. I went to Dad. He said, with that look still on his face, Mickey, it is bad enough to have a boy in the house when your mom and I aren't home, let alone a colored boy. You hear me? I nodded. But the music sounded good, he said. Four years later, my brother Charlie was killed by white men for nothing. Shot in the head. I still miss Charlie. And to this day, I still have a picture of him in my house. I'm still pissed. And I still fight for him. In the back seat as we traveled down 95, in my peripheral, I saw a car pull up beside. Inside was a freckle-faced white kid. Once he realized his parents began to speed up and pass us, he stuck his tongue out and shot me the bird. All I could think was, f***ing coward. It was at that moment that I decided I would tower above hate, but just know that aggression will be met with aggression. I find myself having little compassion and empathy for white people. I love people 
and I hate to see anyone in pain. Yet in this past year, 2020, I just don't have it. I watched a story about a white female restaurant owner being mistreated by the mayor of her city. Everyone was crying and stating their shame. I found myself thinking about all the black businesses who have been lost even prior to COVID 2020. The white woman's pain, Becky's pain, does it compare to mine or the millions of other women who look like me? Our stories are our stories. I don't want to see at your table. I want to create my own. George Floyd, my son, was taken away from his mama during the time of great despair, anxiety, fear, hatred, and anger that was prevailing our country. My heart ached as I watched this senseless murder and the taking away of another black life. A son, our babies, why is this so deep in my spirit, in my soul, losing a child? The loss of a child is always a traumatic experience for mom. Some say he was a full grown man. Yes, but he was still somebody's child. George Floyd, my son, was taken away from his mama. We African-American women lost our son that day, and I cried like a baby. I call it mother's love, killing and murdering of children. When will it stop? When will it stop? I'm an angry black woman, a fighting, mad, angry black woman. Black women, white women, together we must stand. Raise your voices. Let it be known that we cannot take this anymore. Take action. Change the world. My husband Rex was diagnosed with neurodegenerative brain disease in 2014. When the one you love, you've shared your life with, you've laughed together, cried together for 45 years, becomes so disoriented and confused, he does not know where he is or who you are. It hurts and it's frightening to both of you. I remember Rex's frustration at not being able to communicate. One time he came into the kitchen and he was holding his head and he said, I, I can't find what I need in my brain. He told a friend one time, I have this Alzheimer's disease. I call it that because it slams your brain. As the disease continued to slam his brain, he became more disoriented and more remote to me. We could not share memories together, moments of our life together. We could not make decisions together. We could not discuss his illness, first dementia and then pancreatic cancer. I needed to think about how to manage things. What makes him anxious? What helps him relax? I needed to listen. One late afternoon, he said he needed to go home. I wonder if I could get a Greyhound bus, he said. I asked, well, where would you tell them to take you? And he said, they'll know where to go. His anxiety was rising and he said, I have to go home. I have so much work to do. I said, I will take you home. And he looked at me and he said, you would do that for me? I nodded and he relaxed. He had to get some things together, a couple of CDs, one of his many caps. We got into the car. I drove to West Tennessee Street and headed east on out to Capitol Circle. When we got near Appalachie Parkway, Rex saw the sign Tallahassee with an arrow pointing right, and he said, turn right. I drove down the parkway, got onto Franklin Boulevard to west on Gaines Street. When we got near the FSU Stadium, he said, oh, I know where we are now. A little further, I turned into our driveway, and Rex said, 
Oh, it feels so good to be home. We'll fly away, fly away, fly away, fly away home. We'll fly away, fly away, fly away, fly away home. February 23rd, 1981, the day my father died. One of the last things he said to me was to go to my 10-year high school reunion. I'd been talking about it for months. So I went to the reunion, returned to the hospital in my cocktail dress and high heels, and sat at his side. They were preparing to intubate him, so I knew we would never speak again. I started to cry, and he said, Princess, don't cry. It's okay to be sad. I know you're gonna be sad, you'll miss me. But don't cry for me, cry for yourself. Because I'm excited, I'm thrilled. I've been working toward this moment my whole life. And you can be assured that I'll be at the head of the line when you arrive. I saw the joy in his eyes through the tears in mine. The loss of my grandbaby, Ellie, was tempered because I knew he'd be there to watch over her until Moogie arrives. At that moment, the great fear of death that had plagued me my whole life disappeared, and peace was its replacement. My daddy was my joy, my love, my life. And through his parting words, he continues to affect my life and the way I teach my grandkids about life and where I'll be when I'm gone. And not to fear what's in the dark, because joy comes in the morning. I'll be watching over them as my daddy watches over me. Domination and submission, leader and follower, king and peasant. In all of those rules, the difference in power is clear. But where do those stand who are but queer? Where does the power rise? Where does it fall? Is there even any power at all? Is difference a power? Is it a strength? Where can I reach such a tedious length? Am I special? Am I new? Sometimes I think I have no clue. My gender, my orientation, my identity, my sex, my preference, who I wanna be. Can I be different? Can I be me? Can I be different from a she and a he? Can I love the one of my choice? without someone stopping me from using my voice. Can I show myself free and true? This is a break you can't just glue. I'm young, I have a lot to learn. But the lack of freedom in this world makes my chest burn. I'm brave, I am strong. I don't need your pity, I know where I belong. For the first 40 years, of my life, I didn't feel completely a female, but I knew I was a male leader. I heard about getting queer and not fighting with people. I was the only person on earth who considers a different identity a combination of male and a female. And I just told my mom that, Mom, I want to be trans, I want to be a woman. And now I am because I, I feel more comfortable with a girl because I, and I figured out I love is dresses, heels, everything that's fashionable. She's been sending me dresses. I have some of them ball gowns, mermaid uh, dresses and stuff. I am happy to be trans. Justice means to me, wow having the right thing done. Injustice is a reference to the chokeholds I feel the world will never let us out of. I used to think one day that I'd like to move somewhere else and live somewhere else, but the injustice is inescapable. 
So what do we do? We protest, we campaign, we attempt to elect leaders into offices. But these Band-Aid solutions do not eradicate the issues at their core because those who have the opportunity to do more always fall short, like they did to her. Rest in peace, Breonna Taylor. The true changes that need to be made don't need to come from those who are asking for it, but from those who it's being demanded from. Stop handing us the consequences and repercussions of your actions. Take responsibility. That is what's always expected of us, but you cannot even set the example. The word justice, what does that mean in terms of fairness? I remember coming home one day from school and I lived in Smoky Holler, where I was born, and we would walk from school at, alongside the jail every day coming home. A couple of times I would hear this voice from the jailhouse right here on Gaines Street saying, hey, can you tell my wife to bring me some cigarettes? Or can you tell my wife to get me some bail money? They would be there for a couple of days. And then the next time I would know they would be home. I learned something interesting, that those people were part of the group that was selling alcohol in our community. And I couldn't understand that. Well, how would they be in jail for a couple of days and then they're out? Come to find out, they were selling it for the sheriff. He didn't have to stay in jail, but we had to keep up the pretenses. Everybody in the community knows what's going on. And so the cycle continued. The systems that we are operating in every day can also be harming us in a way that we don't recognize. So let's make sure we're doing fairness and justice in our community. Sunny day, a trip with my dad. And he's not mad today. At, at the train station, okay. Are we going on the train? Awesome. Maybe we're going into the city. And he says no. And he says, I'm dropping you off for good. You'll never come back. Why? Because you don't listen. But I don't start any fights. I, I try every second of every day to, to avoid them, to make everyone happy. We are putting you on the next train and that's it. No. Please, no, I'll, I'll change, I'll stop, I'll do anything. It's too late. I don't remember much after that. He, he didn't send me away. I hid in the attic when, when I wanted to play with my dolls. I stayed there, uh, sometimes looking out the third story window up there. I got to play dress up with Lisa. She even played with my hair and helped fluff it up. My parents came home and got mad. I, so after that, I hid playing with my hair. I did what I was told as best I could after that. Stories don't have a beginning. We choose where we want to start them. December 14, 2000, I left Colombia with my two children, Andres and Caterina. Did I ever have the choice to collapse, to be depressed, to miss a life, to argue with God? No, I couldn't allow myself or the kids to contemplate that. That evening, my brother was kidnapped. <laughs> The only hope was that he could listen to a midnight radio program broadcasting anonymous messages from family members to thousands of people kept captive. We didn't know if they would recognize our voices or would be allowed to have a radio, but he did, and also many others who were comforted by the loving messages of my father. That became the father of many when he started his weekly message saying, Hijito, beloved son, we're working on our end to bring you back soon and everything will be fine for all of us. 
my dad's hope brought him back alive. How much do I owe to my dad for his love? Why do I carry wounds from a life I left 20 years ago? I don't know. I can't answer. Could I believe what my father emphatically said to convince himself? Beloved, everything and every day will be fine for all of us. I was lying face down on the back and floor with my dog. He feel the gun barrel press against the back of my head. Only a few people were knowing my hiding place. How could she? Why should she? There was no doubt who betrayed me. I felt so angry and helpless as I, as I waited for the bullet. I remember my mother telling me how people would walk up to me and especially men and tell her how beautiful I was. Um, what beautiful eyes I had. And in the middle of the night, I can remember the stepfather waking, taking me into the bathroom while I was in a dead sleep, you know, and that was my first experience really of, of touching from an adult male at seven years old. And that, that continued till I was strong enough to tell my mother, which probably I was 13. So I was broken probably till I was in my 40s, until I uh, began to see a, a friend of mine's reading the Bible. And I asked her about the Bible. And she got me a Bible. She told me about Jesus. I read about the woman that had the issue of blood and that how she believed that if she got to town where Jesus came, that if she would touch the hem of his robe, that she would be healed. And I thought to myself, well, if she would touch the hem of his robe and be healed, I would, I could be too. So that next Sunday, I had made it up in my mind that when I went to church, that I was gonna touch the hem of the pastor's robe and I would be healed. While the pastor was preaching, I act like I was tying up my shoe. And as she passed in front of me, I touched the hem of her robe. And immediately she looked down at me and she said, my faith has, healed me and she kept preaching. From that day, I knew my heart was healed. It was no longer sealed with bricks. It was no longer wrapped with barbed wire. I had a, a new heart and I was able to love again. I was able to function again. this fresh air approach and looking at joy. I challenge you to think beyond the binary and to expand your definition of fly. Yes, a bird flies. Yes, a plane flies. And if Superman was real, he'd probably fly too. But what happens when we give ourselves permission to let fly simply mean, first, love yourself. This is radical love, love of self. We are rooted in radical love when we create these spaces for black women. That's what this workshop was. So I'm going to drop my cape because black women are known for taking care of others. And I'm gonna focus more on self-care. So I'm taking off my cape and I'm not gonna be superwoman for everybody anymore.
2020. What a son of a bitch of a year. Hating Zoom, but needing connection. Took away our, our, our longing and our freedom to touch. Alone, quiet, and sad. The loneliness of being alone really got to me a few times. It was difficult. Isolated in a place full of people. With COVID, I'm, I'm back in the attic. Living a self-imposed incarceration, living on the edge between chronic lymphocytic leukemia and COVID. We started working on Faust 2020. Then on the Thursday before our opening Friday night, we voted to cancel the show. We packed up and went home, something that would become a theme. Luckily, Sam and I convinced Faust to do Queer as Faust we were creating again in a new way. I was happy to be creating. I am an introvert, meaning that I get the energy sucked out of me when I'm with a group of people. This is introvert heaven. But my husband and I do have to venture outside every now and then. Both of us have mobility impairments and primarily use an absolutely beautiful long ramp built by the city of Tallahassee, but it's 10 years old and the planks were starting to get soft. One night, I trudged sleepily down the ramp. After several steps, I heard crunch as the wood splintered below me. Thank goodness for my dance background, so I was able to grossly not fall on my ass. Ren and I could no longer use the ramp and had to hobbled out precariously down the front steps. Fortunately, a few days later, CARES grant funding to make home repairs with a focus on the impoverished and disabled. <laughs> we were both. There were 300 applicants. Competition would be fierce. Some weeks later, we got it! We are fortunate to live in this proactive, beautiful city that cares for its citizens. <laughs>